Good morning, class. Hi, I'm Keith Moore, and this is Faith School. Faith School is the place where our spirit is fed, our faith grows stronger, and we learn how to be overcomers. I say that because I want you to get that in your mouth and, and uh, you know, get rid of anything that would try to tell you that it's hard to learn this or it's difficult. It's, it's easy when the Holy Spirit reveals it to you. So let's uh, c come right on in the class uh, with your Bible and something to make a note with, and let's release faith that we'll get the exact right thing for today. Father, in Jesus' name, we ask you for utterance, anointing, direction, help, what you know is the best and the right thing for right now, and we uh, thank you all in advance for results from it, in Jesus' name, amen. Turn, please, in our text again to Hebrews 10. Continuing in our study, we're calling By Faith. And uh, notice in Hebrews 10, 38, says, Now the just shall live by faith. If any man draw back, my soul will have no pleasure in him. But we're not of them who draw back unto perdition, but unto them, but of them, rather, that believe to the saving of the soul. As we've been seeing, to have faith means to have courage, to be brave, and to, instead of running or hiding, you stand up, you advance. You have to overcome fear. Fear is the, the enemy and opposite of faith. You know, Jesus oftentimes to his disciples, he would say, uh, uh, why is it that you're so fearful? How is it that you don't have faith or that your faith is so, so small? Everything in this world around us that we live in is influenced by the evil one, the devil and his spirits. Uh, the scripture tells us that he is called the God of this world now. He's not our God, but he's the God of the unbelieving world. And um, in that being true, he's always trying to infiltrate and influence every aspect with fear. And subtly, too. He, he's very subtle about it. Uh, we must heed the witness we get in our spirit, everything we're watching and listening to and feeding on. If you realize, you know, I, before I started watching and listening to this, I was doing okay, but now I'm troubled. Now I'm upset, you know. I, I, I was smiling. I had some joy before I started watching this and listening to this, and now I'm upset. And, and I felt at peace and okay, but now I'm, I'm feeling scared. Well, uh, what, what do you think would be a solution for this? <laughs> Stop watching that. And the thing is, the eyes of man are never satisfied. Your eyes just want to keep seeing more and more and more and more. And if you let them, your eyes will watch anything and want to watch more. But a wise person will be aware of what it's doing to me how it's affecting me. To be carnally minded, which is feeding on carnal things and natural things, feeds that is death, the scripture said. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. When I'm hearing something and watching something, and maybe something like faith school, <laughs> that's what we're believing for, right? I should feel more edified afterwards. I should feel more enlightened, more encouraged, yes. right? Uh, if I wasn't sure if I could believe for it before the class, if it's a good class, then by the end of the class, I'm thinking, well, yeah, I think maybe I can believe for this, right? Right? Yes. That's what you want. 
And anytime you find something that really feeds your spirit, eat it again. Yeah, that's right. hmm? that's right. a, a really good message, a really good service, a really good class, something that, man, it just, it just wound your clock. I mean, you, you heard it and you thought, whoo, glory to God. I mean, by the end of it, you were all built. You need to eat that again. Right. Listen to it again. Watch it again. Why? Because it's just like natural food. I mean, uh, 10 years ago, a potato helped you out. Well, a potato will help you this year, right? I'm just saying, well, the Word of God uh, is even better than potatoes. <laughs> he goes on to say in verse 32, he said, What shall I say more? The time had failed me to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, the prophets. And it goes through all the amazing things that happened with them because of their faith in God. We've been looking at Barak, and if you'll go back again to Judges, the fourth chapter, we saw Israel had left God, they forsook God, and in so doing, they forfeited their protection. And their enemies were able to uh, just torment them and oppress them. And, and that wasn't God oppressing them. This is something a lot of people are confused about. Uh, the scripture said in the New Testament, neither give place to the devil. Why would you be told that? Because you can. Well, if you give the devil place in your life, what's the devil going to do? He's going to do what the devil does. Steal, kill, destroy. And anytime we're seeing that stuff going on, we should back up and think, now hold on. How would I give him place? Right? How would he get in here to be able to do this? Without saying, God... Why are you letting this happen? That's the wrong question. The amazing thing is that he allows what we allow. Jesus said, I give you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bind will be bound. Whatever you loose will be loosed. And he does allow what we allow. And people so many times through wrong choices are leaving God out and going another route, ignoring his plan, ignoring his word, and doing their own thing. Well, leaving God and following another way is opening up to the giving the enemy access, giving the destroyer access. And so in forsaking God, man, their enemies just plowed into them, took them over, oppressed them, killed a lot of their armed forces. And the Bible said they, for years, then they had been cruelly, oppressing them, make, making their lives unbearable, one translation said, until they cried out to God. Aren't you thankful when you, no matter how bad you've missed it or for how long, when you get serious and call on Him, He'll always hear you. He'll always respond. He raised up Deborah, who became a judge in the land, and He raised up Barak, who became a military leader. And uh, the word of the Lord came through Deborah to Barak. I'm with you. I'll deliver Sisera into your hand. Well, he chose to believe it. He did say, we, we got down to this part in verse uh, 8. Barak said, well, if you'll go with me <laughs> to Deborah, <laughs> then I'll go. <laughs> but if you don't go with me, I, I won't go. And she said, I'll surely go with you. This is some courage on his part and her part. Notwithstanding, this is verse 9 of chapter 4, the journey that you shall take shall not be for your honor, but for the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. And Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kedesh. Now, I don't know what he thought about that. Maybe he thought Deborah's a woman. Maybe he thought, She's going to wind up getting the honor and glory. But there was something about him wanting her to go with him. He's thinking, I suppose, that he'll be a great person with a great result in the battle. But there's no faith for self-glorification in faith. There's no room for it. You understand that, class? If you're thinking about, I'm going to show people, you know, through my faith exploit, I'm going to show people that I know what I'm doing. I'm going to show people 
how well I know God. No, you're about to fall on your face. Because this uh, faith in God is not independence. Faith in God is dependence on God. Complete reliance and trust on Him. Well, if He's the one that came through and made all these great things happen, who should get the glory? Right? I mean, anything else is just dishonesty. Who should get the credit? Who should get the glory? Well, the one who did it. Yeah, you're to be commended if you believed Him, trusted Him, obeyed Him, but who actually came in and made it happen should get the glory. And so he, uh, he had to be told that. She said, yeah, I'll come with you, but this is not going to put your name in lights. <laughs> this is not... <laughs> This is not going to wind up with you on the, on the big pedestal. Everybody oohing and on about Barrack. In fact, a woman's going to take care of this. <laughs> and I'm sure everybody around there thought, what? What? What is this? And they might have thought she's talking about herself. But she wasn't. She was speaking by the word of the Lord. Um, I, in fact, go to, go to uh, 1 Corinthians. Let me read this to you. Then we'll continue. 1 Corinthians 1 and 27. 1 Corinthians 1, 27. And this is worthy of spending some time on because you'll see this again and again in these accounts of faith. That it's not for your glory. It's for God's glory. And almost every church going person knows that that's the right answer. And yet, you got flesh and pride to deal with. And everybody likes for other people to be impressed with them. Huh? Look up to them and think they really know God. Boy, they really got some strong faith. Boy, they, you got to get rid of that. Yes. Hmm? And one of the reasons why sometimes people don't do some, even some natural things that they should do is because they're thinking too much about what other people might think or say. Well, they'll think, you know, if I, if I have that, if I do that procedure, or if I have, have that, or I take that medicine, or I do that, they'll think I don't have faith. You need to forget about what you think they might think. That's right. That's right. That will only trip you up. <laughs> that will only entail. And see, there's pride there more than people are wanting to admit. You're too concerned about what they might think about you. We should be more interested in what God knows, right, about us and not trying to prove anything to anybody else. In uh, 1 Corinthians 1.27, it said, but God has chosen the what? Foolish, Foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God has chosen the what? Weak, Weak things. Of the world to confound the things that are mighty. And he's chosen the base things of the world and the things which are despised. Has God chosen? Yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are. God chooses things that other people are not impressed with. <laughs> he chooses people and situations and things that are not on the radar that nobody thinks would make it and do it. He does it purposely. Yes. Why? Because he shows up even more in that. Read, read the next phrase, verse 29, that what? That no flesh should glory in his presence. Verse 31, it goes on to say that according as it is written, he that glories, let him glory in the Lord. In the Lord. So we, we must examine our, our thinking and our motives and our attitude on a regular basis when we're endeavoring to believe for a thing. You know, did the Lord tell me to do this? Then you need to ask yourself that, that all the time. Mm -hmm. Did he tell me to do this? Have I heard from him on this? And then the, the, these thoughts will come to any of us. I wonder what they think about that or... Or, you know, boy, this would really make you look good. Even if you don't say it, these kind of thoughts and feelings are floating around. 
Anytime any of that comes up, you need to grab it and you need to slam it. You need to cast it. I need to cast it down and go, that, that doesn't matter. I'm not interested in people noticing me. I want people, I, I'm not the Savior, right? right? I'm not the healer. I'm not the deliverer. I'm not the provider. We got to get them to somebody that can fix it. Right. Right? right? I can help them. I can show them the way. I can tell them what he did for me. But for them to focus on me, that's a mistake. That's right. I'm not the answer. I know the answer. <laughs> I'm acquainted with the answer. And it's not me. Right? right? So seeking your own glory is something the enemy is always trying to work in. You know, wanting to be more seen, more noticed. People use the word appreciated. You know, people don't appreciate my gift. Do they need to? (laughs) Is it required for what they need in their life? See, we just need to get off of the me channel. Huh? And focus on him because the answer is not in ourselves. And so that's what she told him. She said, this is not going to be to glorify you. In other words, they're already, and this is faith, isn't it? They're already thinking about a big victory. (laughs) Right? And they're already talking about, yeah, but you're not going to get the glory for the big victory. And nobody's whooped Sisera in years and years and years. He's got 900 iron chariots. And they're already talking about victory party, celebration. Who's going to get the credit? So there's some faith going on here, right? And yet, through Deborah, the word came, you need to forget about this glory thing. God says, now, I'm going to do it another way. And a woman's going to get the credit for this. And I'm sure they were scratching their heads over that. But you'll see how it unfolded here in this chapter. Um, Barak, verse 10, he called the Zebulun and Naphtali, and he went up with 10,000 men at his feet, and Deborah went with him. You need to remind yourself this is not a fairy tale. This is history. Uh, Can you see them? This this company of 10,000 people. Who's leading them? An old boy named Barak (laughs) and a woman named Deborah. Whew. <laughs> and uh, uh, it goes on to say that some people that lived in the area sent word to Sisera that they were coming, gave my heads up, which wasn't very nice. And Sisera, verse 13, gathered together all his chariots, even 900 chariots. I mean, he left none of them at home. <laughs> he took them all to the battlefield and all the people that were with him and apparently it was tens of thousands. The Israelites were greatly outnumbered with swordsmen and not to mention the, the, the chariots was a completely other thing on top of that. So I mean, you know, nat- materially, naturally speaking, the odds were really against them. But did God care about all that? Did it limit him? And Deborah said to Barak, Up, for this is the day in which the Lord has delivered Sisera into your hand. Is not the Lord gone out before you? This is where faith comes from. Right? This is how you get faith. This word from the Lord, I know I keep going over it. It is so precious. You know, they used to talk about the what, the American Express. Don't leave home without it. Well, <laughs> this is what you don't leave home without, right? You don't go to the battlefield without this. You don't try to believe for a thing without this. You don't try to believe for money. You don't try to believe for healing. You don't try to believe for reconciliation. You must have the word of the Lord. Everything starts there, is sustained there, and that's how it's finished. His words. And so, Uh, we saw this word back in verse 7 that the Lord gave to Barak, said, I'll deliver him into your hand. And here we see a confirmation and a further word on the actual day of battle. How many think he needed it? They're looking out at all these forces and the iron chariots. Mm -hmm. 
you can see the blades on the wheel gleaming in the sunshine. Mm -mm. These are some tough looking cats. <laughs> right? I mean, everybody in the surrounding countries are scared silly of them. Nobody dares oppose them. And uh, here comes the word of the Lord. Can you see why so many other places is, uh, the Lord would tell his people and his leaders, be strong. Yes. Don't be afraid. Right. Don't be dismayed. Be strong. And those words weren't just audible encouragement. They were spiritual empowerment. They'd come right into him. And when uh, Deborah spoke this to him, she said, uh, get up. So maybe he was sitting down. I don't know. <laughs> get up. <laughs> this is the day. I'm sure everybody's thinking, when are we going to do this thing? Now, this is the day the Lord has delivered Sisera into your hand. I mean, we hadn't fought a, a single uh, moment, and yet the Lord says, it's done. I've done it. I have delivered him into your hand. Is not the Lord going out before you? He said, the Lord's already started this thing. Barak went down, so he left from Mount Tabor and 10,000 men after him, and the Lord discomfited Sisera and all his chariots and all his host with the edge of the sword before Barak, so that Sisera lighted down off his chariot and fled away on his feet. If you go over to the fifth chapter, we see there was some things going on that were supernatural. The Bible said in, in 520, it says they, they fought from heaven. The stars in their courses fought against Sisera. The river of Kishon swept them away, that ancient river. The elements of creation were fighting against Sisera. I guess he lost some things in the river. He lost some things. The Bible said the stars were fighting against him. <laughs> it was not their day. Let's put it like that. It was not their day. And it went from bad to worse so quickly that Sisera, the commander, he leaves his iron chariot. He jumps out of it. He runs away. This is a miracle. Hmm? A handful of people not been, haven't been getting training, hadn't been getting weapons, terribly outmatched, this quick. This is miraculous. This is God. Does God still get involved in his people's business? Does he still manifest things against enemies that are trying to hurt and destroy his people? Yes, yes. He never changes. Never changes. Well, we see the fulfillment of that prophecy. He ran away. And he, he comes to a tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite. There was peace between Jabin and Heber. In fact, it was Heber's people that warned Sisera that God's Israelites were coming. So he figures he's among friends when he gets here. And so uh, Jael was Heber's wife, who was the leader of that, that clan and tribe out there. And Jael went out to meet Sisera and said, well, turn in here, my Lord, turn in to me. Fear not. And he turned in to the tent and she covered him with a mantle or a rug. And, and he said to her, give me some water. And I'm thirsty. And she opened a bottle of milk and gave him to drink and covered him. And again, he said, you stand by the door. And, and if any man comes and inquires, you say, and if they say, is any man in here? You say, no, there's nobody in here. And then Jael, Heber's wife, took a nail of the tent and took a hammer in her hand and went softly to him and smote the nail into his temples and fastened it to the ground. <laughs> and what armies couldn't do, huh? And what campaigns couldn't do and all kind of things couldn't do God used a woman with a tent stake and took him out. And so the prophecy came to pass, you see. It wouldn't be for Barak's glory, but a woman would take care of him. God can do things a million ways you never thought of. But let's back it up, back it up, back it up. What if Deborah nor Barak had had the courage to ever start this thing. You wouldn't be reading about this amazing victory. None of it would have ever happened unless somebody 
had let that word come into them, believed it, and found courage, and overcame their fear, and got the guys together and marched. So many people are sitting, waiting for God to do something. And that's not how it works. So many are pleading and begging and asking God to do something, but they don't realize they're pulling back. They're drawing back. And many times he's already spoken a word that folks have just ignored. No, there's a word. There's a word in every situation, for every person, for every season. There's a word from God. And that word, if you let it in, it'll quicken you. It'll strengthen you. It'll stir you up. And you'll say, I don't care how many iron chariots he's got. He ain't bigger than God. Is that right? I don't care if they say it's incurable. They're not bigger than the healer. I don't care what they say. God's bigger. That courage will come up in you and you'll take the steps. And when you take those steps, God will show up on the battlefield. He will discomfort the enemy. I mean, the stars and the river will join in the fight. Can you see that? And then you're going to see what everybody said couldn't be done. You'll see the miracle come to pass. Well, that's it for today. Said out loud, I live by faith, I walk by faith, I overcome the world by faith, I'm strong in faith, giving glory to God. We'll see you next time here at Faith School. I've really enjoyed being with you in Faith School again this week. I wanted to bring your attention to something the scripture says here in Isaiah 55. It says, everyone that thirsts, come to the waters he that has no money, come, buy and eat. Buy wine and milk without money and without price. Because of the, um, the faithfulness and, and the graciousness of all of our partners, these broadcasts and classes are made available and sent all over the world at no charge. And I'm so thankful we can do that. You know, Jesus paid a huge price for our salvation, but he doesn't charge us individually for it. To us, it's free. If you'd like to help send this to other people, if it's benefited you, you can become a partner. There's information that's on your screen. You can, involved, you can be involved in a multiple of ways, and we can continue to send this to more and more people without price, without charge, and faith being fed is going to make a, a huge difference in the lives of those that do it. Some of these things don't show up instantly, but over a period of time, you just get stronger and stronger. And what the enemy used to be successful in doing against you is not working anymore. And you see victory after victory. We love you. We appreciate you. We'll see you next time in Faith School. Thank you for joining us at Faith School. Class is dismissed for today. But you can watch this and other episodes of Faith School free of charge at faithschool.org. For more information, visit our website or call us at 941-702-7390.